Climate Fight, the world's biggest negotiation, is a series supported by UK Research and Innovation, the UK's largest public funder of research and innovation. There is no planet B. There is no planet blah. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. This is not about some expensive, politically correct, green act of bunny-hugging or blah, blah, blah. Net zero by 2050, blah, 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 net zero, blah, 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 climate neutral, blah, blah, blah. This is all we hear from our so-called leaders. Words, words that sound great, but so far has led to no action. Over the last few years, young people around the world have voiced their outrage over the climate crisis. Young people have a unique stake in climate breakdown. They face a future world that looks nothing like the one their parents had. And we demand change! I'm Jack Marley, and this is Climate Fight Episode 4, The Youth Movement Grows Up. Ahead of COP26, in an effort to find out how decisions are made, I want to explore the role of young people. For instance, is the youth climate movement as strong as it once was? So I think we have to go back to 2018 at least. So Greta Thunberg started striking outside the Swedish parliament. Youth climate marches started happening in the US of the zero hour protests. And particularly importantly that year in October, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change IPCC report came out on what 1.5 degrees of warming would mean for the world and what we'd need to do to achieve it. I'm Dr Harriet Thew. I'm from the Sustainability Research Institute at the University of Leeds and my research focuses on youth participation in climate governance and climate change education. So that really catalyzed action from young people and from older people through Extinction Rebellion as well in 2019. I saw Greta Thunberg at the UN climate negotiations in Katowice at the end of 2018 and she did not make anywhere near as big of a stir as she did the following year. So she was kind of starting to get well known but it was really in 2019 that Fridays for Future or School Strikes for Climate as it's called in the UK that the movement really took off. Today's lesson, civil disobedience. Here in Manchester and up and down the country, thousands of students from reception to year 13 skipped school to call for action on climate change. I'm kind of quite interested in the idea of age and how that was really significant in the 2019 youth strikes. And I was just wondering, what do you think the influence of young people is on climate politics more broadly? Yeah, I think young people are particularly good at raising the profile of upcoming events and policy areas, capturing the public interest and emphasising urgency, the need to act now. Because young people have symbolic power, they're representative of a huge proportion of the global population and they have moral power. So they're seen as having greater moral integrity because they're not being paid to take a particular stance. So they're sort of seen as representing the moral voice, the moral interest, and going a bit further than some organisations go in demanding change and saying what needs to be done. Right. And so how does that moral voice of young people, what kind of influence does that have on decisions at the UN climate negotiations, the COP? For example, the youth constituency in the UN climate negotiations, Youngo, has had quite a lot of influence on the policy that is about climate change education 
because they're seen as recognized experts in that area. So going and being able to share their lived experiences and say, this is what happens in my school or university, or this is the education that I had, and this is why it works or doesn't work, leads to very tangible changes in UN policy that you can see, you can document over time. Whereas the kind of bigger protests, moral voice, general messages of we need change and we need it now, it's much more difficult to measure the kind of tangible impact of that. Just before COP26 kicks off, the 16th Conference of Youth will also take place in Glasgow. Young people from about 140 countries get together. The main output is that they create a policy document that is given usually to the COP president and to other people within the COP. It'll be young people probably getting all together to think about what they want to see coming up in those negotiations. So does this youth conference influence the tone of the COP at all? What kind of influence do they have, if at all, on the adults meeting right afterwards at the COP? It's a really good question. By the time governments get to the COP, they have already determined, for the most part, the positions that they're going to be taking at that COP. So at that last minute stage, it's very difficult to influence very much. You could say that it's a bit symbolic. It depends on how decision makers respond to it, whether or not they actually read the declaration that the young people have come up with or not and how much attention they give to that would very much depend on the COP president or whoever else has been given it. There are also declarations from previous years. It's hard to say whether host governments, for example, would look at the outputs from the previous COP to think about how to include young people's perspectives. And I guess that another problem that youth climate activists have at this conference is that there are probably a lot of adults who would look at people who are you know in their teens or early 20s and say that you know you're too young to really know what you're talking about and I remember when I was your age and I had all these sort of these unrealistic views of how the world works what would you really say to someone who levels that criticism at young climate strikers yeah you get a lot of that when young people come forward to engage in anything they're quite readily patronized and deemed to not know enough I think it's interesting in relation to climate change because Although climate change education is very inadequate and needs improving, it does exist. So young people are learning about climate change in school and through social media and through non-formal education groups in a way that those older decision makers probably didn't get during their schooling. So it might be that they've had more kind of formal educational training on climate issues than the politicians have. In terms of this idea of when you grow up you'll understand that it's more complicated and you're too naive and this is too kind of idealized I've noticed that a lot of the time young people are a bit ahead of the curve in what they're asking for in terms of climate action they're a bit less cautious a bit more honest about what needs to be done and really acknowledging the urgency of the situation so they're often you know five years ahead of everybody else for example in 2009 2010 at the cops in Copenhagen and Durban young people were calling very strongly for the target of 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels which didn't then come into the Paris Agreement until 2015 and we're still not on target to meet it but they were advocating for that at that point and leaving fossil fuels in the ground. I was at the Rio Plus 20 Sustainable Development Conference in 2012 and young people were very much calling for an end to fossil fuel subsidies and leaving fossil fuels in the ground rather than burning them, which is becoming much more mainstream in climate discourse as we realise that we're going to need to make some of those hard choices. But young people are a little little less swayed by, oh, this is going to cost my business a lot of money and how am I going to transfer my employees from this role to that role or whatever it is and can be a a bit more kind of forward thinking and visionary in terms of what they're saying needs to happen. We wanted to introduce Harriet to a young climate activist, Abel Harvey Clark. He's from Newcastle and going to university in London. They spoke when Abel was outside, just on his way home from a protest. 
Nice to meet you, Harry. And yeah, I've enjoyed reading your stuff as well. So thanks. Nice to meet you too. Where are you right now? I'm uh, just away from the XR Rebellion in London. Came down yesterday to be part of the rebellion here. Great. So tell me about when you first got involved in climate change activism. It was the school strike movement really that got me involved. I feel I'd been to a couple of Extinction Rebellion meetings before, but wasn't so sure on it. I wasn't quite sure what was going on. And the school strike started happening. Just realised that uh, no one else was going to do it for us, you know. I had to go do it ourselves. So started uh, yeah, getting together with other people in my sixth form and organised a walkout for my sixth form with about 70 people to join the global climate strike in March. Go through that process and yeah, the many trials and tribulations that it threw up and it kind of, I guess, being part of that protest and that movement then revealed yeah, the wider struggle that we have in our hands. Yeah, that's interesting. So you organised it for your sixth form. How did your school respond to that? Um, with, I was going to say two faces, but probably more than two faces. I don't think anyone felt any real support. I would, it would definitely be opportunity to say support of I think individual teachers. Definitely, I think, gave help where they could. But I guess the school as an institution was very much, don't go, you'll be punished if you go. That's what they told the students. What they told the press was, oh, we won't punish anyone. We support all those students thinking about climate change. And then literally at the same time, there was kids sitting in isolation and detention for being part of the protest. So one of the demands of the youth climate strikes was about teaching the future. Did you learn about climate change at school? And if so, do you think it prepared you and your peers for tackling climate change, coping with an uncertain future, creating the futures that you want, and potentially pursuing green jobs, if indeed that is something that you would be interested in doing? I mean, I was taught about climate change to the extent of like the almost like the scientific equation of more greenhouse gases in the air means the world heats up. And I guess maybe we talked about like the fact that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere increasing, but like it's quite detached from what's actually happening and the points in which like our lives interact with it. It's a very depoliticized version of climate change as well. So like, I never went into the things that are making climate change happen, who's controlling the, yeah, the levers of climate change and who's feeling the impacts of it. Yeah, thanks. That's really interesting. Has how you think and talk about climate change changed over time? And has your approach to activism changed at all, sort of the activities that you've been involved in? We keep learning about the struggles that people have been fighting against climate change for a long time. People who've been kicked off their land for generations, people who've had water shortages. There's a lot of lessons to be learned from around the world. Yeah, that actually links to something I've found quite a lot in my research where I've kind of found that initially a catalyst and talking point for young climate activists is around intergenerational justice with messaging like it's our future so we deserve a voice and how old are you going to be in 2050 asking older yeah. generations that and over time I've seen quite a lot of young climate activists sort of move away from that type of advocacy after hearing stories from people and I've seen some young people start to feel a bit ashamed of their sort of relatively privileged position in the movement and stop talking about youth as a consequence and stop talking about future and just talking about the need to support global south countries and other vulnerable social groups like indigenous peoples and women and I wonder if that's something that you've seen happen or have felt yourself the more that you've interacted with people the more that it's become harder to I don't know maybe keep up some of the the narrative that the youth climate movement started with. No, yeah, it's really interesting that that's come out in your research. That's important. I am like a little bit wary of people can kind of bounce to the other extreme and say, kind of almost absolve themselves of any responsibility and say, because we're privileged, there's nothing for us to do. All we can do is support other people elsewhere. The conclusion is to stand on the sidelines and cheer on other people. And I think that's definitely no answer either. There's like people in the older generation who've been fighting, fighting, fighting like really hard and even whether that's for hundreds of years or even in the last 10, 20 years. Absolutely, if we don't take on the lessons and what they've learned, then we're not starting fresh. The generational divide is quite a simple one. Say, oh, well, you old people messed it up. For now, us young people are dealing with it. I have no doubt there's, unfortunately, there's a lot of young people who will continue the same mistakes and abuses that older generations did. Why would we want to organise by ourselves? Like, maybe have some spaces, but I don't know what, if you've seen like spaces where young people can kind of exist without any 
guidance or support for older groups? Is that like, a, is it a thing that people try and be quite like youth separatists? Not separatists, no. There are quite a lot of youth groups that are entirely youth led and are very keen that their advocacy and campaigning is all decided by young people rather than by other groups that are very keen to show solidarity with other groups. For me, having a youth voice on climate change, though, it's more than just having young people represent and repeat the messages of scientists or NGOs, but in a more enthusiastic or creative or radical way. Because we know that climate change doesn't affect everyone equally and that members of the same local communities, even in the same geographical communities, can have quite different experiences, including women and girls, people living in poverty, people of colour, people with disabilities, etc. And what I find is that what's often overlooked is that youth intersects with all of those groups and and then that produces unique challenges so uh, for example I've just been doing some research with young people in South Asia and there were some interesting findings around transgender youth in Pakistan uh, were vulnerable in a way that wasn't really getting picked up uh, or school kids in Yorkshire that their school closed because of flooding and they had to travel 45 minutes to a different school and then got bullied because they were at this different school and they didn't know anyone and obviously different levels of vulnerability there between the two examples but there are things that young people experience in communities experiencing climate impacts that older people in those communities don't experience and that those issues aren't really very well represented in decision-making processes and it's something that to my mind the youth climate movement isn't so good at of identifying their unique vulnerabilities needs and perspectives and communicating them so that youth are seen as having something different to say and it's really valuable so I'd like to see the youth climate movement doing a bit more to share specific stories of how young people in impacted communities around the world are experiencing climate impacts so that their needs can be factored in processes that are designing adaptation and mitigation projects and in making investments as well uh yeah i wonder if if you agree with that and how young activists kind of navigate that and if there's a need for more support to build young people's capacity to then identify and share their unique lived experiences as young people um no i think it's really interesting it kind of opens up it's become a perennial question about like identity politics how that kind of fits in with like other analyses i think because i agree like what you're saying about like the specific experience that young people have and like that is definitely a unique contribution but I guess I'm kind of wary of that just sort of being relayed as a like another one ticking the box of another like inequality and saying oh we've had these voices heard no, but I don't think um, people's voices on executive boards or in uh, shareholders planning meetings I don't think like the presence of young people's voices is really gonna is that necessarily crucial and young people is probably one of the social groups that has one of the widest experiences of climate change I think well, from those who live lives of privilege because of profiting off fossil fuels or whatever, through like family ties to all scales of like intersecting oppressions. That's or- something that I found in my research, actually, that I think is really valuable, that youth climate activists don't necessarily fit a particular mould. They're much more open to trying different approaches. One day they might be, you know, put on the suit jacket and be talking to politicians and the next day... They've got their T-shirt on and they're in a strike. And it's very much more about being exposed to and engaging with a much wider variety of spectrum of views and thinking about finding their own role that fits within that and how they want to contribute, but while still supporting others that are trying to essentially achieve the same outcome, but maybe pursuing different ways of doing that. I found that quite different to older activist groups who tend to have a of corporate or organizational identity of this is the way that we dress and speak and interact and present ourselves it's something that I find quite refreshing about the youth climate activist movement that it is a little bit more open-minded I guess Uh, but I wonder is there anything that you think youth activists can add to the climate movement that older adults can't I think what you just described in like not conforming to that kind of like corporate activism really important i think yeah more mobile more like willing to get out and these like more sometimes more confrontational and more challenging actions i heard someone describe it as like youth climate strikers want to knock the door down and charge through before they know what's on the other side of it because they realize the door needs to be knocked down and like we don't know quite know what they're heading for but 
until we start going for it. And like that's the process by which we work out where to go is is by getting on with it. Well, I do see actually that sometimes it's a little bit easily dismissed by older generations who say, oh, I thought that when I was your age and then I grew up and became more realistic, which I find a little bit infuriating because it's yeah. it's not about, for me, it's not about as you get older, you sort of conform to the status quo when we are all in agreement that the status quo is unworkable and that it can't continue and that it needs to change because we need emissions to peak and decline now so I think it's an interesting rhetoric that people use in response to young people I wonder one of the things that I've come across in my research is kind of a loss of momentum over time as young activists either burn out through frustration or kind of age out of feeling that they can speak for youth or move on and get other jobs and then are a little bit more tied by having to toe the line of whoever they're working for. Have you seen any of those issues in the group yeah. that you've been working with? Yeah, definitely. It's been hard. I sort of dropping of a pandemic. Yeah, it definitely didn't help the, uh, the school strike movement. But I agree, it was, it was dwindling before the pandemic as well. I think that was just like the two at the same time made it really difficult. Maybe people could be discouraged by... Uh, that feeling of like should we put all this energy into it we did all this stuff and then and then like what happened kind of thing um, yeah and again it comes back to being, I think sort of being aware of the history of struggle and realise that although the school strikes themselves are quite a new thing campaigning and protesting and taking action about climate change is not a new thing and people have been trying along hard for a long time so I don't think we're not going to solve it overnight either and again it can't just be sort of solved by mindless action there needs to be a good bit of reflection as well in there I've seen some quite good critiques of the idea of being an activist, being someone who just always acts and doesn't like really think about what the action is doing. And instead, both have the action, but yeah, reflection as well and think about tactics. And I guess that's not maybe as fun or exciting as going on the street and dancing and music and shouting. But that goes more slowly. And I think going on the street and protesting is a very good way to start that. Uh, yeah, I've seen some research on that from a, a guy called... Mark Hudson in Manchester, who says, if all you have is a hammer, you see every problem as a nail, which is like, if all you <laughs> do as a group is have protests, then you just do that for every problem. But some problems, you know, protest isn't necessarily the right approach. And thinking about how to apply the right tool for the right opportunity which I think is something that as we said before we've seen that with youth activists not conforming as much and thinking about strategically what is the right approach Listening to Harriet Nable reminded me of how diverse the youth climate movement is and how it benefits from looking outwards to related struggles all around the world Many young activists are disillusioned with the lack of progress on emissions since students first walked out of lessons a year and a half ago. What other options are there for young people to force action on climate change? We spoke with another researcher to find out. I'm Linda Dunlop. I'm a senior lecturer in science education at the University of York, where I teach and do research mainly in science and environmental education. For Linda's recent research, she spoke to young people affected by fracking. That's a process of extracting gas. To do it, people inject water, sand and chemicals into rock to create fractures that the gas can flow through. The teens Linda spoke to lived in England and Northern Ireland and they lived in places where fracking was happening or where companies were looking to start fracking. So they were all aged between 15 to 19 and they were concerned about fracking in their local community, but also on the impacts of fossil fuel extraction on the climate. So we were asking them about fracking, but also about their responses to protest. One of the kind of things that we found surprising was a preference for other forms of political participation. So preference for things like lobbying, making legal challenges, signing petitions, writing to MPs, those sorts of methods of protesting or being active. So what are the drawbacks of protesting exactly? 
Well, for the young people we spoke to, it was mainly around disruption and the fact that it affects the communities that are also affected by the fracking, by the thing that they're objecting to. It doesn't always reach the decision makers who can actually listen to them and do something as a result. So the sorts of things that they talked about were like holding up holding up barriers in streets, outside access along the roads, outside entrance to the site, those sorts of things. And I guess whilst they saw that it raised awareness and it got media attention, often the media attention was about the protest or aspects of the protest rather than on the issue, which then kind of can cause division within their communities. So what are the sort of perceived benefits of those other methods of activism, I suppose, the letter writing and petitions that you described earlier? The sorts of actions that they preferred, they saw as being able to reach decision makers directly, being able to communicate with the people with responsibility, being able to connect with larger networks and groups. So, for example, when they were talking about social media activism, connecting with other people with similar interests was seen to be quite important to them. And probably most importantly, control over the message, the message in the media was often about the protest, whereas they felt by using other methods, using their own voice, they were able to say precisely what the issue was. Did you get a sense from them that they saw any limits within those tactics as well? Um, effectiveness, really, I think. So I'd say that was kind of the the key message overall, is kind of a frustration with formal ways of participating so a feeling of not being listened to and really seeing protest as an action of last resort when legal processes fail when politicians don't listen when companies don't listen i mean i'm actually really struck by your research because usually whenever there's sort of a big demonstration you know whether it's this thing on the m25 where activists have been blocking roads and stuff like that the government's usual response is to say that the protests themselves are reckless and, and counterproductive on all these kind of things. And it seems as if the young people you spoke to kind of accepted that and were sort of sympathetic to that view. And even going through the channels that, you know, that are sort of considered legitimate, like speaking to MPs and stuff, they still found that their kind of desires were frustrated, even though they were doing the things that were kind of supposed to be a proper way of, of airing your views on something, I suppose. Yeah, I think that was one of the interesting things, I suppose, about the research is just how well informed they were. They respected the processes and they wanted the processes to work. And it was really that frustration that they didn't work, regardless of whether they were taking part in protest or not. They did want political processes to work. That's. I think that's... It's just very sad, isn't it, really? But I think that's a very kind of good point you make. Uh, The last thing I wanted to ask is that, do you think that young people are more limited in the tactics they can employ when it comes to trying to affect change? Well, yeah, I mean, I guess most of the participants that we spoke to couldn't vote below voting age, and they tend not to be the ones in the house that are kind of making those decisions about which energy provider and maybe not paying their energy bills. They were also living in more rural areas where they felt that maybe they weren't listened to as much as if they were in an urban area. And they also tend to be in education all day. They've got lots of things going on. And I think maybe that's one of the key things that I'd say is for decision makers, if you go into a school where you're speaking to a broad section of young people from different areas, they're really well informed about the issues, about how to take part. And I think a lot could be learned from listening to people in those schools and colleges. It's fair to say that young climate activists are used to being disappointed by those in power. But I don't think world leaders will be able to ignore them forever. The movement is grounded in communities all over the world, and activists like Abel aren't giving up, but are instead learning more about the climate crisis and how it relates to other struggles. Strikes have resumed in some places, and young people are trying different strategies. Watching how the youth climate movement has evolved over the past few years, it may just be getting started. If you're listening to this episode when it first comes out, COP26 is about to start in Glasgow. I'll be there, 
and have an episode coming out right after. In that episode, we won't just tell you what was agreed at COP, we'll tell you how, taking you behind all the factors that can make or break an international climate negotiation. See you for episode 5. Thanks to everybody who spoke to us for this episode. The Ant Hill is produced by The Conversation in London. You can get in touch with us on Twitter at TC underscore audio, on Instagram at theconversation.com, or email us on podcast at theconversation.com. And you can also sign up for our free daily email by clicking the link in the show notes. If you're enjoying the series, please follow the show and leave a rating or review wherever podcast apps allow you to. Please tell your friends and family about the show too. Climate Fight, the world's biggest negotiation, is produced for The Conversation by Tiffany Cassidy. Sound design is by Eloise Stevens, and the series theme tune is by Nita Sal. Our editor is Gemma Ware, and production help comes from Holly Stevens. Thanks also go to Will DeFreitas, Stephen Harris, Joe Adetunji, Chris Waiting, Katie Francis, Khalil Kasamali, Alice Mason, and Zoe Jazz at The Conversation. To James Harper and his team at UKRI, and to Imriel Morgan and Sharai White for helping us to promote the series. I'm Jack Marley. Thanks for listening.